And we welcome you back to New Hope Baptist Church on our Wednesday night Bible study time. And I'm asking you to take your Bible, please, and go to the book of Titus. Titus chapter number two, please. And uh, we will be in contact with you, hopefully, within the next number of days. Don't know if it'll be before Sunday, but uh, we're paying attention as Governor Abbott opens up the country uh, with phase one. And, uh, and of course, as soon as it opens up to the point where we can have larger gatherings, uh, we're going to let you know. But uh, we're heading in the right direction. We praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for being in Texas. Amen. But to look at Titus chapter number two, please, and verse 11 in your Bible this evening. And if you will, Titus chapter two, verse 11, the Bible says this, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men or to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And uh, verse 13 says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. I'm going to ask you please to pray that we might get God in on this thing and get him involved and uh, that he might uh, use me and uh, use all of us and use the truth to make a difference in each of our lives. Let's pray, bow our heads for prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that, again, you, as we open your word, we know that you have a truth, a truth that can be life-changing, a truth that can make all the difference. Lord, a truth for me, that if I would live, Lord, what a, what a wonderful thing that it would do to my life, to my home, to my family, to our church, to, to others, Lord, uh, that, uh, that my life can make a difference and impact. Dear Lord, I pray your blessing now as we teach your word and as we listen. Lord, again, give us what you have for us tonight. May we be eager to receive it in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like to start by saying this this evening. Uh, what motivates you? What motivates you? What motivates you? What gets you out of bed uh, every single day? Many people, it's money. It's the almighty dollar that gets them going. Some, it's being successful and uh, being able to, for others to say that they're a success. Some follow after uh, what they hope will make them happy. They find something and they think, that's going to make me happy. That's going to make me feel good. That is what's going to bring me happiness in life. And so that's what gets them going. That's the engine that drives them. That's the motivation that they find in their life. Uh, we can look at people that are religious. We can look at religious people that are part of reli different religions. The dedicated Mormon, what motivates them? The dedicated Mormon is motivated by keeping the observances and the rules that they have to keep to earn their salvation. Uh, it's not much different for the Jew and uh, the devout Catholic as well. The devout Catholic they know that they have to go to Mass on the Holy Day. They have to go to confession at least once a year uh, to get their sins confessed they, uh, and forgiven. They have to receive Holy Communion during Easter week. And uh, uh, there's some Catholics that have been struggling this past week or so. Uh, they have to have one... Uh, only one full meal on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, and they can't eat meat on Fridays during Lent, during the Lent season. And uh, uh, the motive, their 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 observances and their laws and their uh, all their different policies and things. That's what motivates them in their life uh, religiously. As a believer, Christians, you and I, what is our motivation for living? What is our motivation? Rules. Let me ask you this evening, what is it that motivates you in the Christian life? Is it keeping rules, keeping regulations and laws? Is it uh, fear of the judgment of God on your life? Is it pressure, the pressure that you have, uh, other Christians watching you and uh, seeing what you're doing and the pressure of other believers? Is it a heavenly reward? Is that your main motivation? Is it the rewards that you'll have in heaven? What is it that drives you to live a godly Christian life. What is it? When we get to Titus chapter 2, verse 11, Paul begins to encourage his pastor uh, friend and his pastor uh, in the faith, Titus, to teach the believers in Titus's church or the church that he pastors about what should motivate them, what should drive them. In these verses, Titus learns two key words to teach 
the one in the church that desires to live on a path of a godly life. And those two words that Paul gives to Titus to teach that person who wants to live godly, that person who wants to live on a godly path, to say no and then to say yes. To say no and then to say yes. Godly living, let me just say this, godly living starts with saying no. Godly living starts, did you hear that this evening? Godliness starts by saying no. No is what starts on the path of a godly life. And then it bookends itself with a yes. But why godly living? Why live godly? Why choose to live like God? Why? Titus may have said these things to Paul. Paul, how should I motivate our people? How should I motivate the people that I pastor? Give me some reasons why they should say no and then say yes so that they can live godly in a very ungodly world. What can I teach them? What can I motivate them with? What things, what reasons can I give them? And Paul maybe said back to Titus, Titus, tell the people I'm going to give them one reason. One reason only. Just one. That's enough. That's all they need. No rules. No observances. No ordinances. One motivation, one thing to get them out of bed every day, one reason to choose to live God's way. Paul shines a neon light on the one thing that is the driving force, the engine that wants to push you and push me up the mountain and forward toward a life of godliness. Michael Jordan was the engine of the Chicago Bulls dynasty basketball team in the 90s. He stepped away for a little while and then came back. And while he was away, they didn't have the engine that drove their championships. And then when he retired a few years later, they didn't have the engine anymore. So the train couldn't go anywhere. And the train of that dynasty was done. And it was standing still and since then has stood still. No wonder people struggle. No wonder people, Christians, struggle with living godly and holy. They struggle to grow in their faith. They have replaced the one engine that God has given us with something else, and yet they're still trying to grow. They're still trying to be people of faith and grow in their faith. And Paul wasn't the only preacher who knew the name of this engine that we are all to hitch our trains to if we are going very far with God. Anyone who's going to go far with God, they got to hook their train to this one engine. And there were others like Peter who knew the name of this engine. There were many others. It was Peter who told us how we grow closer to God. It was Peter who told us how to grow more like God and to grow in our faith and to grow our faith and to grow to live godly lives. It was Peter who said, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Christ. Only one great motivator for the believer. One. Only one engine to press us up toward higher ground. None other will do. None other will last. None other will sustain us. None other has an endless supply of fuel for us to carry on and to carry upward to a godly holy life. Jesus grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. And what does it say next? The grace of God was upon him. When he was flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus was full of what? Grace and truth. What came to us by Jesus Christ? John chapter 1 verse 17. Grace and truth. When Barnabas, and uh, when he arrived in Antioch, what was the one thing that so moved Barnabas? so moved him that he saw inaction that caused Barnabas to exhort the believers there to all cleave to the Lord with all their hearts. He saw the grace of God at work. When some of the religious people chose to break away from their religion and follow Jesus and become born-again believers, they turned from their religion and followed Paul, Paul and Barnabas and uh, broke away. Paul and Barnabas, uh, as they were following them, persuaded all of them to do what? Continue, continue in the grace of God. Remember in Acts chapter 15 when some of the Pharisees got saved? but we're still urging Gentiles who are getting saved to be circumcised after the law of Moses. So Peter had to stand up. 
And Peter stood up, and what did he say? First he said, they heard the gospel, those Gentiles. Listen to me now, Pharisees that got saved. Listen to me, those who came from the Old Testament uh, Jewish uh, laws and regulations. Listen to me, those who've been trying to keep the Old Testament, though the Mosaic law, and couldn't do it, and now you've come to Christ. Listen to me. They, the Gentiles, heard the same gospel you heard, just like you. They believed the same gospel that you believed. They saw their hearts. We, God looked down... And and God saw the hearts of those Gentile people who put their faith in, in him. And uh, God gave them, chose to give them the Holy Ghost of God, just like you. And God put no difference between us and them. So why are you putting a yoke on the neck of other believers that we all know our forefathers could not wear? They could not carry that yoke. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob couldn't carry the yoke. Moses couldn't carry the yoke. Those after Moses under the Mosaic law couldn't carry that yoke. I mean, uh, it, that, that yoke was too heavy for them. And now you're trying to put that same yoke on those who God has already approved, who God has already given the Holy Ghost to, who God has already uh, received them because they believe, re heard and believed the very same gospel that saved us. What was the next thing Peter reminded all of them in Acts chapter 15, verse 11? Peter said this, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. All salvation comes from Jesus. And that salvation he offers is wrapped, the salvation that we have received was wrapped and is wrapped inside his wonderful grace. It's through his grace. His salvation is through His grace. Our relationship, our connection with God, our connection with His Son began through and because of His grace. And every step we take after that is to be driven by the very same engine. God's amazing grace. It was Paul and Silas who were sent out, but they were only sent out because they were recommended by the grace of God. Paul said in, to the 12 apostles, or he said of the 12 apostles, that they only received their calling as apostles by grace. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 5. As believers, we are to live by faith. And Romans 4.16 then says that it is of faith that it might be by what? It is of faith that it might be by grace. Romans 5 and verse number 2 says that by faith we stand where? Right now, we stand where by faith? We stand, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We stand today in the grace of God. Before we got saved, what used to abound in our life? Sin abounded, but we got saved. But why? Because where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Believer, what are we under right now? What are you and I, believers in God, believers in His Son, saved by the blood of the Lamb? You and I that have been saved by the blood of Christ, Romans 6 and verse 14, what are we under right now? Ye are not under the law, but under grace. We are not only saved by grace, because grace abounded in us more than sin, but upon receiving salvation, we are now under grace, under grace. What did Paul say to every man that is among us? We, why do we not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think? Why was it that Paul said to all the men and women around him, he said, you know why? You know why we don't think highly, more highly than we ought to of ourselves? You know why that we think with humility like that? Here's why. Through the grace that was given unto Paul. The grace that God gave Paul to teach that wonderful truth. It came from the grace of God. What did Paul say? How do each of us receive the different spiritual gifts in the local body? According to the grace that is given to us. Whenever Paul put the believers in mind of something in the churches, he would go to the churches or write to the churches or maybe to an individual believer or a friend or a co-laborer, and he would write, uh, he did so, why? He, when he put them in mind, he put them in mind because of the grace that was given to him of God. Paul said of himself, by the grace of God I am what I am. By the grace of God. By the grace of God. 
When Paul would finish his letter to a church or a fellow laborer, here's the other statement he would make. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with you all. Paul wrote the Corinthian believers to commend their growth. He wrote the second letter and he bragged on them. Since his first letter, they had grown and they were maturing in the Lord. And here's some of the things he, he, uh, he was impressed with. Here are some of the things he commended them for. From the time he wrote the first letter, now they had grown and they had grown in faith. They had grown in utterance. They had grown in knowledge. They had grown in all diligence. They had grown in their love. But now he says, you've grown in these areas, but I'm now going to encourage you to abound in another area. He uses these words. He says, see that ye abound in this grace also. Let me explain. The Macedonian churches, if you go back to the early part of the chapter I'm referring to, the Macedonian churches had begun giving to Paul's mission work and also to other Christians and other churches who had great need. These Macedonian churches, they didn't have much, but of what they did have, they gave. And so they began this thing of ministering to the saints of God and ministering to those who labored in the work of missions. And Paul was encouraging now the Corinthian church to begin doing the very same thing that the Macedonian churches were doing. And he says this, See that ye abound in this grace of ministering to the saints of God, ministering to the other churches, ministering to Paul and the others who are in in, in mission work, getting the gospel around the world. He said, See that ye abound in this grace also. Paul called ministering to the needs of other saints an act of grace. This grace also. Also, in addition to what? If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 7, in addition to all the other acts of grace that they had been abounding in. All the other acts of grace that they had grown and were were acting out in their... What was Paul saying? If you go back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 7, their faith, where they had grown in faith, their faith was of grace. Their utterance, what is that? They had now become uh, to the point where the words that were coming out of their mouth in their conversations with one another and in the community, their utterance was now mature and godly and spiritual. They were using spiritual words now coming out of their mouth. And those words of utterance were words that were of grace. Their knowledge that they now had in the Lord was of grace. All the diligence that they were showing in their life came of grace. Their love that they had, their love for Paul, their love for the other believers, their love for other churches, their love for the Lord was of grace. All of these things they were doing were motivated by one thing, God's goodwill, God's kindness toward them, God's love that God had shown them, God's freely given love and goodness, and it all comes from that word grace, the grace of God. They were living each day by His grace, under His grace, having been saved and forgiven by a God who simply chose to love them, period. No questions asked. No jury needed to decide. No case to argue in their defense. If you see Titus chapter 2, verse 11 again, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And then in verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. See, it was only grace that redeemed us. My beloved, it's only grace. Brothers and sisters, it's only God's grace that redeemed us, not religion. Religion did not redeem us. Rules and ordinances did not redeem us. Just grace. Just grace. All by Jesus giving himself for us. Offering himself to all mankind to redeem us. To set us free from captivity. To set us free from our wickedness. To set us free from our lawlessness. To set us free from our disobedience to God. He did it for us. For the sake of us. In behalf of us. Instead of us. He took our punishment. And so... We say, no, no to ungodliness. In verse number 12, teaching us that denying, no, 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 I'm under grace. No, I'm in the grace of God. No, 
I've experienced God's grace. No, God has been very favorable to me. No, God has been very good to me. No, God chose, God chose of no merit of my own. God chose despite my wickedness. God chose simply because he wanted to, because he loves me, not with any other reason, but that he loved me just like I was. No ungodliness and worldly lust. No. We reject ungodliness tonight. And worldly lusts, we say no. No, we live under the grace that saved us. No, how could we leave God out in our lives now that we've experienced and we're under his grace? No to worldly passion. No to worldly lust. No to the things in the world system that dishonor God. No, for if we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. No, the world passeth away, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. No is our response of the love back to God for his gift of grace to us. When the television and the movie and the social media mock the Bible and mock traditional Bible values, we respond because of God's grace with an emphatic no. How about you? Are you doing the first thing you must do to be godly? Say no to the world tonight. Say no. That's where it starts. You've got to say no. You cannot be godly. You cannot be holy. You cannot be like God. You cannot act like God. You cannot go the way of God unless you first say no. Many studies have been done to show that there is very little difference between the way of life of the child of God and the way of life of the unsaved world and how they live. And then we see to say no so that we can live godly. And then it is grace alone that calls us to say yes to godly living. At the end of verse 12 says we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. It's God's grace that gives us the power it's God's grace that gives us the motivation. It's God's grace that is the engine to daily say, yes, I'm going to live like God. Yes, I'm going to be like him. Yes, I am going to be like him because one day I will be like him because one day I will see him as he is. Yes. God's grace is the believer's motivation, is the believer's engine to live a godly life and that is the engine we hook our train to the grace of God the gospel we have received was of grace so as believers we just say no and then yes for we are now under his very same grace what motivates you to go to church what motivates you to give to others, to give to help your local church, to give? What motivates you to serve the Lord? What motivates you to live in a godly fashion, in a godly way? Is it the only engine that will never, ever run out of fuel? Out of the fuel that your train will need every single day? God's amazing grace? The, psal the psalm writer says, all of grace is my story, all the way from earth to glory, since by grace he lifted me from sin and woe. Living grace, living grace, not saving grace now, living grace he hath extended, as on him my heart depended. He'll give new grace when it's my time to go. There's been grace for every mile. There's been grace for every trial. There's been grace sufficient from his vast supply. Grace to make my heart more tender. Grace to love and pray for sinners. But there'll be new grace when it's my time to die. Grace not yet discovered. Grace not yet uncovered. Grace from his bountiful store. Grace to cross the river. Grace to face forever. But there'll be new grace I've not needed before. The atheist said, if there's a God, let him prove himself right now by striking me down dead right now. 
nothing happened. He shouted, you see, there isn't a God after all. And there was a believer close by who then responded, no, sir. All you've done is to prove in your life that he is a very, very gracious God. I'll end with this. During the building of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, construction went way, way behind because several workers in the building of the bridge were falling off of the scaffolding and falling to their death. Engineers and administrators couldn't find a solution. They had many costly delays. Finally, someone suggested that they place a gigantic net that it would be hung under the bridge to catch anyone who would fall. In spite of the enormous cost, the engineers opted for the net, and after the net was installed, progress was hardly interrupted at all. In fact, a worker or two fell into the net, but they were saved, and uh, ultimately all the time because people knew that they were safe. All the time that they lost to fear was regained by replacing fear with faith in the net. Let me ask you, as we're done tonight, what did we, what did we pay for God's love? What did you and I pay for His Son, for His Spirit, for His heaven? What did we pay? Nothing. Yet every day we get to live, every day, above the net, the amazing eternal net of His grace. You understand why you and I can live at peace in the Christian life? Why we can love choosing to live God's way? Because we're living in safety. We have the ultimate Perfect, indestructible, uncompromised safety net. The eternal grace of our God. And from above that net of safety, you and I, because of the safety of God's net of amazing grace, from above that net, you and I say no to ungodliness and then we say yes to a life lived after the ways of God let's bow our heads please Heavenly Father thank you for your word thank you for the truth tonight Lord none of us are perfectly godly we did not quote the statements that Paul made about his own Christian life when he said oh wretched man no one is ever what they should be when it comes to godliness and holiness. But Lord, we tonight choose again to let what motivates us and drives us about the Christian life and living with you and living for you and living in a way that honors and pleases you. We choose to let what motivates us not do's and don'ts and laws and ordinances and can't do this and have to do that. Yes, the commandments of God are for us. And yes, we prove our love for you by keeping your commandments. But may our motivation be and always be the grace that we stand in and the grace that we safely stand above and the grace that we are under under your grace in your grace surrounded by your grace because it was all started because we were saved by your grace dear Lord may I as an independent fundamental soul winning bus running King James Bible, Baptist, Christian, and pastor make my engine and my motivation and what drives me and what gives me purpose and desire to live, yes, godly and no ungodly. May all of that 
be because of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And folks, that is it for tonight. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, we'll be in touch with you. It may not be before Sunday, as we said. But again, thank you for coming. Looking forward to Sunday morning. And uh, if not sooner than that, we'll see you Sunday morning, 11 o'clock.